All right, let's do a quick recap of kinetics or the introduction of kinetics before we get into all the details of kinetics. And we talked about thermodynamics and how equilibrium constants relate to delta G. And we said that if delta G is negative, we have a spontaneous reaction. If delta G is positive, our reaction is non-spontaneous. But even if a reaction is spontaneous, it doesn't tell us whether or not the reaction is going to occur in a reasonable amount of time. Put another way, let's say you designed a reaction to make some kind of blockbuster drug uh, that could make all kinds of profit. However, that reaction took, you know, 10 years to occur. Well, that doesn't sound like a very useful way to make that drug. And so we have to take a look at kinetics, which deals with the rate or the amount of product that can be formed over a given amount of time. And it says here that the reaction rate is a function of what? The number of molecular collisions that occur over a certain amount of time. And reaction rate is affected by these factors. Number one, the concentration of the reactants. And you would remember this from general chemistry when you studied rate laws. For example, if you saw a rate law like this, the rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of A. Well, we see that concentration is related directly to rate. Now, for the next three, activation energy, temperature, and sterics, they would have been seen in something called the Arrhenius equation. So the Arrhenius, Arrhenius equation, which was our rate constant is equal to A, the pre-exponential factor, multiplied by E to the power of negative EA over RT. And so we see how our rate constant, which is directly proportional to our reaction rate, rate constant is related to activation energy. Rate constant is related to temperature. And the geometry and sterics are found in A, which again is the pre-exponential factor. And then we also have to consider whether we have the presence of a catalyst because this can also affect the rate of our reaction. Well, let's get into it and talk a little bit more about a rate law. A rate law is determined, or sorry, the reaction rate rather, is determined using a rate law. And you would have seen this in general chemistry too. For example, rate is equal to our rate constant multiplied by the concentration of our reactants. And so we see from this formula, again, that rate depends on the rate constant and it depends on the concentration. Rate is directly proportional to rate constant and to the concentration of the reactants. And thus the degree to which the change in reaction concentration will affect the reaction rate is known as the reaction order. You might remember that we have an exponent here sometimes. For example, we have X and the degree, or sorry, the, the exponent, which is the, um, uh, has an effect on the reaction rate. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get into this slide here, which will give us more detail on how reactant concentration can affect the rate of reaction. So the order of reaction is represented by X and Y. Let's say you have a reaction. Let's say you have A plus B that uh, gives you some product. Well, if you were to write a, a rate law, you'd say rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of A to the power of X times B to the power of Y. And those exponents, if you remember, those have to be determined experimentally. There's no way to just look at a reaction and guess, you know, or surmise what X and Y would be. We measure them or calculate them using the method of initial rates, which is something you would have done in general chemistry too. We don't do that in this course, so don't worry about it. And if you're wondering, well, what do I need to know about a rate law? Well, you need to remember this, that if we have rate is equal to K times the concentration of A, and if we have no exponent, well, that's assumed that it's to the power of one. And so we say that is first order. If you have rate is equal to K times the concentration of two reactants, and they're both first order, you combine those one plus one to give you two and you say the reaction is second order. And finally, we can have a third order reaction. For example, we have A squared multiplied by concentration of B. Now, you also need to understand the relationship between um, the order of the reaction and how changing the concentrations will change the rate. 
if we have this rate law here, if rate is equal to K multiplied by the concentration of A, well, if I double this, it's going to double this. If I have this rate law here, rate is equal to K times concentration of A times concentration of B, same thing, if I double this, it's going to double this. But if I have my A to the power of two, as I do in this third order rate law, well then, if I double the concentration of A, then you're gonna be taking two and you're gonna be squaring it, which gives you four. That means the reaction uh, rate would be quadruple. And in general, something else you need to know is that if you have a large rate constant, a large K, it's going to be a fast reaction. And if you have a small k, it's going to be a slow reaction. Well, let's get into it here and talk about activation energy. Activation energy is nothing more than the energy barrier between the reactants and the products. If you think about the reactants as being people on a roller coaster, you step on, you, you know, you got to climb the first hill, tick, 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 so you get to the top, and then it's all downhill from there. So the amount of energy that it takes to get you to the top of the hill that energy barrier to overcome that, that's the activation energy. It says here that the activation energy is the minimum amount of energy that you need for a molecular collision to result in a, in a reaction. So just because two molecules collide doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a reaction. They have to collide with sufficient energy, enough energy to overcome the activation energy. And so the number of successful collisions is dependent on the number of molecules that have a certain threshold kinetic energy, enough kinetic energy to get over that activation energy. And what we see is that, let's say you have a distribution of your molecules at a certain temperature. They all fit under this curve here. Well, if your activation energy is here, you see that only, this, only successful collisions are going to occur for molecules that have that certain threshold energy. So the only molecules that have enough energy to react are the ones in this blue shaded area here. And if we can decrease the activation energy, or yeah, if we decrease the activation energy, let's say we could lower it down to here, call this Ea prime, for example, well, then what does that mean? You're going to have more successful collisions, right? And you're going to have a higher rate of reaction. It's going to be a faster reaction if you were to lower the activation energy. Here it is shown in a reaction coordinate diagram. If you have a low activation energy, you're going to have a faster rate. And if you have a higher activation energy, you're going to have a lower rate. That's all there is to it, my friends. Nothing more than that. Well, let's talk about temperature. You might remember the shape of this curve here that's not symmetrical. It's called a Boltzmann distribution. And what happens is that if we increase the temperature of our reaction, it's gonna shift the average amount of kinetic energy that this, um, the molecules have to the right. You see that our average is somewhere kind of here maybe for the blue curve, but for the red curve, it's over here. And you can clearly see that manifested at our cutoff, our activation energy that the area under the red curve is greater than that under the blue curve. And thus, when we're at a higher temperature, more molecules are gonna have enough kinetic energy to produce a reaction. We just have more molecules with more energy that can overcome that uh, um, activation energy barrier. And one rule of thumb that we see in chemistry is that if you increase, increase temperature by 10 degrees Celsius, it will sometimes or usually doubles the rate. So we'll put here doubles, doubles reaction rate. And again, that's a rule of thumb. You can't hit your wagon to that 100% of the time, but it is something that we see oftentimes. Now, the next point, which is the steric considerations that was worked in that pre-exponential factor of the equation of the, um, the Arrhenius equation. This is something that's going to be covered in detail in chapter seven. But the bottom line is what you need to know is, again, just because molecules collide doesn't mean there's going to be a reaction. They've got to have sufficient energy, right, to overcome that activation energy. But just because the molecules collide with sufficient energy still doesn't mean there's going to be a reaction. Molecules have to collide with the correct orientation. 
in order for bonds to be broken. So even if they're hitting each other with enough energy technically to overcome that activation energy barrier, they've got to be colliding in the correct orientation. And check what it says here. It says if the reactive confirmation of a compound is high energy, it's going to spend less time in that confirmation. And so the possibility of a collision resulting in a reaction is going to be low. Now, if you're still not 100% sure about what I'm talking about here, again, we're going to explore, explore this in detail. Really, all you need to know for Chapter 6 for our quiz will be the molecule's got to be in the correct orientation. Okay, There's something to do with the way the molecules are oriented that has to be just right in order for the reaction to occur. And I bet you that everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice would be able to go and explain this to a first year student or maybe a high school student, explain them, or explain to them that a catalyst is going to speed up the rate of a reaction. Why? Because a catalyst drastically lowers the activation energy, right? That's what a catalyst does. So if you um, uh, think about um, enzymes that you might have studied in biology, you would have studied you know, peptides and proteins, and an enzyme is nothing more than a biological catalyst. Well, what does an enzyme do? All an enzyme does is speeds up a reaction. Well, how does it do that? It lowers the activation energy of a reaction. And oftentimes, a catalyst will not only lower the activation energy, but it will also provide an alternate pathway. So it'll create some kind of new pathway that also, again, has that lower activation energy. And we're going to see several reactions in organic chemistry that involve catalysts. In fact, the first one that we're going to look at uh, in chapter eight, I believe, we're going to talk about using metals as catalysts like platinum, palladium, you know, nickel, things like that. You know, these are elements that I don't even think have come up in class yet, but we're going to talk about them later on as catalysts. Well, we've seen a lot of reaction coordinate diagrams so far in this chapter. And let's talk a little bit more about these reaction coordinate diagrams. Very important. They show up in most chapters of the textbook. And you have to understand how these reaction coordinate diagrams relate to kinetics and thermodynamics. And you've really got to understand, my friends, that kinetics and thermodynamics are completely different concepts. Let's get it straight in our minds. Kinetics deals with the rate. How fast is the reaction? So if we were looking at this reaction coordinate diagram here, and we were talking about the kinetics or the rate of reaction, we'd be thinking about how high or how much, or what's the activation energy? You know, what's that barrier that the reactants need to overcome in order to be converted into the products? Whereas when we're talking about thermodynamics, we're not talking about activation energy at all. Thermodynamics deals with the relative potential energies of the reactants and products. You know, is this an exergonic? Is this a, you know, an endergonic process? Are we going to have mostly reactants or products at equilibrium? That's what thermodynamics means. So kinetics, again, I'm just reading from the bottom. Kinetics refers to the rate of the reaction, whereas thermodynamics refers to the equilibrium concentrations of reactants and products. Thermodynamics is related to Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, entropy, those kinds of things, K equilibrium, whereas kinetics is related to the reaction rate, which is related to activation energy, temperature, sterics. All right, well, let's move on from there. Take a look at this reaction coordinate diagram. You get two pathways um, that result to two different sets of products. A and B can go through the pathway in red and be converted to E and F. And A and B can go through pathway, the blue pathway and be converted into products C and D. We notice that the formation of the products C and D has a lower activation energy. Just look, you can clearly see that this is lower, right, than the activation energy to get all the way up here. Okay, this is definitely a higher activation energy. I won't even, you know, pencil that whole thing in there. And so the products C and D are going to occur or form at a faster rate. Um, and what else? we see that C and D are more stable than E and F, right? They have a lower potential energy. And so they're going to be favored based on thermodynamics as well. And oftentimes in organic chemistry, 
we see reactions where the formation of the products is um, kinetically and thermodynamically favored, right? This is kinetically favored. This is thermodynamically favored. We could circle these here, kinetics, thermodynamics. However, uh, we will see situations where there's going to be a battle, if you will, between kinetics and thermodynamics. Let me show you an example. Take a look at this one here. If we look at A and B, here they are, A and B, being converted into E and F, well, that's definitely got an advantage in terms of kinetics, doesn't it? It's got a lower activation energy than the formation of C and D. However, C and D are thermodynamically more stable. So what's going to happen is that if we provide enough energy, there's going to be an equilibrium between the two, and eventually we're going to end up making more of C and D. But we could say that the formation of E and F is kinetically favored and the formation of C and D is thermodynamically favored. And when we're dealing with this kind of situation, temperature is going to play a pivotal role. Let's pencil that in here. Will, we'll put down here, will depend on temperature. Again, at a high temperature, the thermodynamic product is going to predominate, whereas at a lower temperature, the kinetic product will predominate. And that's something that we'll look at later on in the class, uh, how that relates to an exact, you know, specific reaction. But uh, for now, you just need to know what's on this slide here. You need to know kinetics and thermodynamics. Many reactions in organic chemistry will both be kinetically and thermodynamically favored. However, sometimes we can end up with a situation where kinetic products are favored at lower temperatures, whereas at higher temperatures, we end up with a thermodynamic product. Well, one more short thing that we need to talk about before we get into the discussion on um, uh, nucleophiles and electrophiles, and that is transition states and intermediates. If we look at a reaction coordinate diagram like this, what we're gonna see are reactions like this one here where it's got kind of one step and then you kind of get a second step after that, and then you might even have a third step and so on and so forth. So we'll see multiple steps occurring in the same reaction. In the maxima that you see in this reaction coordinate diagram, we call those transition states. So these transition states occur at the maxima, whereas the valleys or the minima, so the minima, or you could call it a valley. This is where we have what are called intermediates. And you need to know the difference between these peaks, maxima, where the transition states are, and the valleys, which is where the intermediates are. So let's talk about transition states and intermediates. And a transition state is where there's a transition happening, right? Uh, a transition state is very high energy. It's the maxima on a reaction coordinate diagram. And tra transition states, since they're so high energy, they are fleeting. You cannot isolate a transition state. Okay, you can't stop a transition state, observe a transition state, because wh what a transition state is, is where there's going to be bond breaking and bond forming um, can be happening simultaneously. On, the, on an energy diagram, transition states are the energy maxima. I already went over that and represents and ugh, Represent the transition as bonds are made um, and bonds are broken. All right, so that's what a transition state is. Again, I'm repeating myself here, but it's high energy and it's fleeting. Okay, you cannot directly observe it. Okay, you can't isolate it. You can't put it in a jar. Well, let's talk about um, an intermediate. It says here that an intermediate is an intermediate species. Or during the course of a reaction, these are the minima. In intermediates, in fact, they are observable. They are an actual chemical species that will exist for a period of time before reacting further. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole explanation that he has in the textbook of a person jumping up on top of a desk and he says, well, when the person's in the air, if you take a picture of them, that would represent a transition state. And then if the person lands on top of a desk, that would be an intermediate. It's a pretty good a uh, way of explaining it. If you want to take the time to read that, I'll let you do that on your own time, but you need to know the difference between a transition state and an intermediate. And with that, that brings us to what's called the Hammond postulate, 
the last part of section 6.6. .6. Let's take, take a look at what the Hammond postulate is. It says, first of all, if you have two points on an energy diagram that, that are close in energy, then they should be kind of similar in structure. Well, that makes sense, okay? You're starting here with this compound, you do the reaction, you end up with another compound. So there's obviously bonds being broken and bonds being formed. If we look at the maximum, the transition state, we see that the bond between the carbon and the bromine is being broken and the bond between the carbon and the chlorine is being formed. However, if we go a little further on our reaction coordinate diagram, we just go a little further down the road here, well, the bond between the carbon and the bromine is gonna be a little bit more broken because you're gonna lose the bromine in the end here. And the bond between the carbon and the chlorine should be getting a little stronger, a little shorter, okay? And, but we see that these two are cl closely related in structure. So again, what I'm summarizing here is if you have two points on an energy diagram, they should be similar in structure. And so how does that relate to our starting materials and our products? Check it out. It says, based on this assumption, we can generalize the structure of the transition state depending on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Well, this is an exothermic reaction shown here. And what would that mean about our transition state? Here it is. If we have an exothermic reaction, the products are lower in energy than the reactants, or put another way, in an exothermic reaction, the energy of the transition state is gonna be closer to that of the reactants. Therefore, the transition state is gonna look a lot like the reactants. Whereas if we have an endothermic reaction, since the products are higher in energy, they're going to be clo more closely related to the transition state. So that is all you need to know about the Hammond postulate. If you have an endothermic reaction, the transition state is going to more closely resemble the products. If you have an exothermic reaction, the transition state is going to look like the reactants. And with all that background, that brings us to a new section, section 6.7, where we begin our discussion on nucleophiles and electrophiles. And to me, this is kind of where we pivot the course a little bit, not 180 degrees or anything like that, but we change orientation a little bit and we really get it looking or taking a hard look at reactions in organic chemistry. So ionic or polar reactions, which is what we deal with 98% of the time, um, in this class, except for in chapter 10, but ionic or polar reactions occur when one reactant has an area of high electron density and the other reactant has an area of low electron density. And something you've got to train your eye to be able to, to do, and that's what we're going to look at in section 6.7, is to be able to recognize an area of high electron density and to be able to recognize an area of low electron density. If we have a negative charge, we know that it is going to be attracted to a positive charge. I think that most of you would have studied physics and you know that opposites attract. There's going to be an electrostatic attraction between a negative and a positive charge. Well, how does that relate to organic chemistry and reactions? An electron rich species, which you've got to be able to recognize an area of high electron density is going to be attracted to one of low electron density or an electron deficient species. And with that, let's take a look at these two structures on the bottom. We have methyl chloride and methyl lithium. So methyl chloride is on the left, and then we have methyl lithium on the right. What's the difference between these two compounds? Well, if you look at the bond between the carbon and the chlorine and the carbon and the lithium, they reveal something. Uh, they reveal the, the big difference in the electrostatic potential maps. Take a look at the two EPMs or electrostatic potential maps here and here. What does the red mean? So if we have red, that means that we have an area of high electron density. So you can see that in methyl chloride, all the electron density is up here, whereas in methyl lithium, it's all down here. Well, what's the difference? In methyl chloride, all the electron density is up by the chlorine, whereas in methyl lithium, it's all down by the carbon. Why would that be? Well, it's based off of electronegativity. The electronegativity of a chlorine is around 3.0, whereas the electronegativity of a carbon is around 
So that means the chlorine is more electronegative than the carbon. We can represent that by drawing a dipole arrow like this. You can put a delta plus by the carbon, and you can put a delta minus by the chlorine if you want. But what they're trying to highlight in this slide is that the carbon is partially positive, has a partial positive charge. Why? Because the chlorine is withdrawing so much electron density away from the carbon. But if we look at the methyl lithium, we see a very different picture. Now we have a partial negative charge on our carbon. Well, that is also, again, based on electronegativity. Lithium is a metal, has low electronegativity, about 1.0, and again, carbon is about 2.5. And so we draw our dipole, but now the dipole is going in the direction of the carbon because carbon is more electronegative. And the conclusion is that the carbon in methyl chloride is electron deficient based on the dipole, and um, it is partially positive. The carbon in methyl lithium has a partial negative charge because it is electron rich. What are the words that we use to define the two carbons? How do we differentiate between them? We say the carbon in methyl chloride is electrophilic. We say the carbon in methyl lithium is nucleophilic. Now, besides the terms electrophilic and nucleophilic, which I'm going to get into in more detail, give me a thumbs up if you're following me on what I've covered up to this point on this slide. Are there any questions? Let me just tell you, because I know that I've been talking a lot, and we're going to look at some questions in a few minutes. But um, don't hesitate at any time to ask me a question. These are very important so, uh, very important um, concepts, and we're going to look at some practice problems where we're going to practice recognizing nucleophiles and electrophiles in just a little bit. Well, with that in mind, let's move on. And let's talk about nucleophiles in more detail. A nucleophile, what's a nucleo? Nucleus is nucleo, right? So what's the charge of a nucleus? Well, a nucleus is positively charged because it contains protons or protons and neutrons. And then file, if somebody said you were an audiophile, you're maybe a lover of, you know, some kind of fancy stereo equipment or whatever. So a file means a, a lover of something. And so a nucleophile is a nucleus lover. Well, if something loves positive charges, that must mean that it's electron rich and can donate electrons. And so a nucleophile is a Lewis base, right? A Lewis base is nothing more than an electron donor. It says the more polarizable the nucleophile, the stronger the nucleophile. Well, let's take a look at why all of these are nucleophiles. The methyl lithium, we went over that in detail. It's because carbon is more electronegative than lithium that this carbon is a nucleophile. What about ethoxide? Well, we have a negative charge plunked right on the oxygen of ethoxide. So if you have something that's got a negative charge, that's going to make a good nucleophile. What else? If you have ethanol, well, ethanol doesn't have a negative charge, but it's got two lone pairs on the oxygen. And we know that lone pairs, they're not involved in a bond, so those could be available. They can behave as a Lewis base. And then also an alkene, well, an alkene can donate a pair of electrons from a pi bond because a pi bond is weaker than a sigma bond, and therefore a pi bond can also be a nucleophile. All of these can behave as electron donors. If you go over to our textbook, which I have open over here, it gives you, you know, a pretty thorough treatment of nucleophiles. So this is the section on nucleophiles right here. And you can see that he put anything that's got an oxygen with a negative charge, an alkoxide, whether it's hydroxide, methoxide, ethoxide, terbutoxide, these are all good nucleophiles. Okay, and then he said, don't even worry about the, the, the cation, right? Because you could have a lithium, a sodium, a potassium, whatever. Um, and that will come as we discuss these nucleophiles more. But these all make good nucleophiles. Why? Because the oxygen has a negative charge. And he said, well, just like we saw, ethanol could be a good nucleophile. So can methanol, water, terbutanol. These are as strong a nucleophiles because they don't have a negative charge. However, they can behave as a nucleophile. A weak nucleophile, notice that it says weak nucleophile. I can't highlight it. The highlighter doesn't work on here. But I want to show you what I did highlight, okay? Because I can't explain it any better than the textbook. I think all I highlighted was this thing right here. Because I said that nu uh, nucleophilicity, or the ability to be a good nucleophile, 
is partially based on this idea of polarizability. The polarizability is something that you would have covered in general chemistry one when you discussed intermolecular forces, but polarizability, it says loosely defined, describes the ability of an atom to distribute its electron density unevenly in response to external influences. Let's keep going and read from the book. It says polarizability is directly related to the size of the atom and more specifically to the number of electrons that are distant from the nucleus. For example, sulfur is very large and has many electrons that are distant from the nucleus. And its electron density can be unevenly distributed when it comes near an electrophile. Iodine shares the same result. As a result, iodide and the hydrosulfide ion are both very good nucleophiles. And again, a nucleophile's polarizability just means that it can distort its electron cloud. So as we get a bigger electron cloud, we get a stronger nucleophile. Well, what about electrophiles? Electrophile, you can guess, based off of the rationale of nucleophile, means an electron lover. It's something that likes negative charges. So Electrophiles are positively charged or partial positively charged. Electrophiles are Lewis acids. They are electron acceptors. An example of a good electrophile would be a carbocation. If you've got a carbocation, well, that's definitely looking for a pair of electrons to stabilize that positive charge. And we saw earlier on with the example of methyl chloride, why if you have an alkyl halide, like this, since we have a dipole going towards the chlorine, this carbon is partially positive, so we say that it is electrophilic. We say that is an electrophilic carbon. And again, you need to train your eye to be able to represent or recognize nucleophilic sites and electrophilic sites in molecules. Now I'm going to skip this problem right for the moment. I'm going to skip it. We'll come back to it in a little bit. But table 6.3 gives you a summary of some common um, nucleophilic centers and electrophilic centers. Let's start with the nucleophiles and let's review. If you have a polar bond where the carbon is more, um, you know, where one atom is more electronegative than the other, for example, like methyl lithium, well, the carbon here would be nucleophilic because it's more, it's partially negative. A lone pair, like in water, that can behave as a nucleophile, it can behave as a Lewis base. But this would be a weak, a weak nucleophile. Whereas if you had a charge on the oxygen, like in hydroxide, this would be a strong nucleophile. And then a pi bond can also behave as a nucleophile. For electrophiles, we said that methyl chloride would be an electrophile, we went over that, and a carbocation could be an electrophile. And we'll see many other examples of nucleophiles and electrophiles as we um, move on in the course. And that brings us to section 6.8, which deals with mechanisms and arrow pushing.